That's all right. <laughs> now, we have some birthdays. One anyway, it's a special one. How old are you, Glenn? Huh? What? 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 How old now? Old enough to know better. Yes? I'd like to praise God for our new safe return from visiting Vermont on Thanksgiving. And because of that, we're having our thanks, family Thanksgiving today. Oh, good. And I want to also thank God for bringing our new and I together. And this morning we got up early to do all the fixings and the turkey, and we were working on it. And halfway through it, she said, I would really like you to get ready and go to church. Anybody else want to? Oh, oh, birthdays? Oh, you have a blessing? What? Oh, good. Wonderful. Sing, she may be listening. Mary Ann, when, when was your birthday? Next Saturday. This Saturday? This coming Saturday. So you're you're on the hook. Phyllis, Mary Ann, Glenn, and who else? Anthony? Brooklyn. We should do this alphabetical. We never had this many, have we? So, Anthony, Brooklyn, Glenn, Mary Ann, and Phyllis. All right. Anthony, Brooklyn, Glenn, Mary Ann, and Phyllis. Got it? Are we missing any? Fess up. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Anthony Brooklyn. 
Len, Marianne, and Phyllis. Happy birthday to you and many more. All right, let's say a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for birthdays. We thank you for the, the multitude of blessings, a lot of which we acknowledge this Thanksgiving season. Help us to be thankful every day of the week for the things that you do for us. All this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. While we're making the transition to children's worship time, I want to remind you that this Thursday is the Voices of Hope concert at the Conneaut Human Resources Center. Uh, it's a community Christmas concert involving our high school uh, choir as well as some church groups and uh, several ministers reading scriptures at the Human Resources Center. So it is, we're invading the holiday with Christ. <laughs> um, and then, in a little over a week, we host a Jerry Garcia concert here on December 9th. And uh, we're going to have some refreshments afterward. And so next Sunday, we'll pass around a clipboard uh, for things like cookies and uh, snacks and stuff, something that's going to entice some fellowship and hanging around a little bit afterwards. Uh, and that, that concert will be December 9th, just as a reminder. And I have put a poster on our Facebook page. If you are on Facebook, share it to your page. And when you do that, then all of your friends get to see it. And maybe you've shared it already, but you can share it a second time and, and keep it active, keep it out there. And bring your friends and neighbors to this concert. Tell, spread the word about it. I'm going to be on uh, Sunrise Live, which has a pretty good sized audience. Um, on Tuesday morning, and I'll be talking about it and pushing it then. So, anyways, that's enough about that. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. This is our starting point in the whole theme of what we're going to talk about today. And if you want a goal in life, a guiding star, here's a good one. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you will commit to doing this, you will be happier live longer, do well in life, have more friends, more people will like you because you'll be a more likable person, and you will have a deep sense of peace because you've got this close connection with God and you are grateful to Him. It's an orientation in life that is worth pursuing because it is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Think about that. Some people say, I, I don't know what God's will for my life is. I do. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 8 to 18. It's pray, be joyful and be thankful in all circumstances. That's God's will for you. If you will do that, then you open yourself up to his blessings that come in so many ways. The Old Testament contains an account of a man whose life fell apart. But his confidence in God's wisdom and purpose carried him through. Some of you are very familiar with this guy because you've read the book that is named after his name. 
and the first time you read it, it, it shocked you and disturbed you, and you didn't want to ever read it again. It's the book of Job. You know what happened to Job. First of all, a disaster came upon his family. They were gathered for a Thanksgiving meal, and the house fell in, and they were all killed. And then, if that weren't enough, Job got sick. And he had a horrible disease that was painful and disfiguring. And his friends misunderstood what was happening to him. They, they read this as some kind of a judgment by God on him, that he had some secret sin that God was trying to root out. And that's not what was going on. Even the man's wife misunderstood, and she, she said, just, just curse God so he'll kill you. You're going through too much. All these people meant well, but they misunderstood what was happening. But Job trusted God. And here is the key to his attitude. It says that this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head, a sign of grief. Then he fell to the ground in worship, not in complaint. He fell to the ground in worship. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked will I depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And this commentary is made on it. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. That summarizes Job's attitude. Oh, it wasn't that Job didn't have questions. It wasn't that he didn't struggle what was ha with what was happening to him. It was not all, not all tranquil and peaceful, but here was Job's core value. Instead of saying, why would a good God allow something like this to happen to me, an innocent man? Is not God fair? Why is he being so unfair to me? Instead of that, he said, I came into this world with nothing. Anything my ha I have, my beautiful family, my home, my possessions, my comfort, it's all a gift from God. God deserves my praise, not my criticism. It belongs to God to start with. It's not even mine. If he decides to take it away, then I'm back to where I started, but no worse than when I started. And if he chooses to give me more, it's up to him. He is God. You might say that Job had an attitude of gratitude. One that was pretty remarkable. Now maybe you can help to appreciate Job's attitude in the midst of his terrible suffering and tragedy. If you contrast it with someone else, who had a different attitude in life, a different orientation, different core values. In fact, this guy was a grouch with a capital G. He was the kind of guy that you say, I don't want to be like him. <laughs> but sometimes you find yourself being like him. We hear about him in, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, and I want to read the section about him and then give you a little background. It's 1 Samuel 25, the verses 2 and 3. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, and he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal. And his wife was named, wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. But her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. 
are surly and mean in his dealings. Ever run at anybody like that? <laughs> I, uh, we've got an appointment to, uh, to get our car inspected. You know, the totaled one that I bought, rebuilding it. And the way the process goes, when you get the car, you have a salvage title. And it's not legal to drive it on the road. It's not roadworthy. So you do the repairs, you keep all the receipts, you take the salvage title, the receipts, to an Ohio Highway Patrol inspection station. There's one in Brook Park, there's one down near Warren, there's one in Findlay, and then there's a bunch in southern Ohio and the Columbus area. And so you have to take it to one of those, and they look the car over and make sure it's put together, it's safe to drive, and then they look at all of your receipts. They want to make sure that you didn't buy parts from a chop shop. So you have to have verification that you have a, a sales receipt for every part. And if it's a used part, you have to, it has to have a VIN number. A VIN, actually, it's on, on it. And uh, my neighbor has done this several times with cars he's rebuilt. And so he said, you don't want to go to the one in Brook Park because they are mean and they're hard to get along with. So he recently took a car that he just finished for his daughter to the one near Warren and he said, the woman who helped me there was wonderful. She was accommodating and she was helpful. Guess which place I'm going to for the inspection. Some people are mean and surly in all their dealings. And some people are kind and accommodating and helpful without compromising. Which kind of person do you want to be? <laughs> do, you, do you want to be Nabal? I don't think you want to be him. You see, this was during the time when, when King Saul was obsessed with killing David. That shepherd boy that God, you know, the smallest and the puniest of his family. The one that God had selected to be the next king of Israel. He's not king yet because Saul is still in office, but David is going to be put in office soon by God. And Saul is, he is savagely jealous and he wants to kill David. And so instead of taking care of business for the kingdom and taking care of the people, his total focus in life is killing David. And so David has assembled, he's assembled a squadron, <laughs> a ragtag bunch of soldiers, of warriors, not just to defend David, but also to take care of the people of Israel. And they've done things like protected the people from warring tribes that would come across the border and try to steal their, their flocks and herds. And uh, they're in the area close to where Nabal is, and they have been watching out for Nabal's shepherds and protecting them. And the shepherds appreciate it. And so, you know, David's got five to six hundred men to feed, which is not easy. So he sends a few of his young warriors to talk to Nabal and, and to kindly request just a little bit of food to help feed his army. And Nabal is surly and mean in all his dealings. And he doesn't just say no, but he insults David. He says, David who? Now, everybody knew about David. And so when the young men come back empty-handed, David is angry and offended. And so he musters his army to go and kill every male in Nabal's household and all of his servants. Abigail, the intelligent and beautiful wife of Nabal. Why on earth she got connected to this guy, I don't know. It obviously was an arranged marriage. She 
she heard about it, and she put together a lot of food and took it to David's army. David was impressed. She came and apologized for her surly and mean husband. And David withheld his hand and did not attack her husband and his men. So, when Abigail came home and told her husband what was about to happen at the hands of David, he had a heart attack, and 10 days later he died. And so David proposed marriage to her, and she accepted, and she became David's wife. <laughs> a little bit of a strange outcome from that one, right? Now, who would you rather be, Job or Nabal? <laughs> I mean, how many of us have ever yearned to be Job? <laughs> But Job was a man who said, naked I came into the world and naked I will leave. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is good all the time and all the time. Do you really mean that? How about when you feel miserable and nothing tastes good and nothing looks good? And you get depressed because it's gone on for a week and you wonder if you're ever going to feel well enough again. Or you get a terrifying health diagnosis and you wonder what the future is going to hold. Or you get an injury or the arthritis has grown to the point that you're always in pain. Or you suffered a tragedy. And your loss is so deep that you wonder if your heart is ever going to be healed from that. Can you say at that time, I came into the world with nothing. And I can take nothing with me when I leave this world. But the Lord gives. And if he chooses to take away, I'm okay with it. May God be praised in all circumstances. That's Job's attitude. And Nabal's attitude was, it's all mine, and you can't have any of it. I built this myself. I earned this all myself. And I'm going to take care of myself first. Who ended up in better shape? If you read the last couple of chapters of Job, you find out after a long time of dialogue and back and forth about this, it tells us what happens, that God multiplied Job's family and wealth, and in the end, he ended up better off than he was at the beginning. And we learn at the very first part of Job that God was not punishing Job, but that God was showing him off. Showing Job to be a person that is the epitome of a good man of faith who truly trusts him. So instead of Job having to wonder, what did I do wrong? The truth of it was, he did everything right. Now, speaking of David, the one who ended up with, with a wife like mine, <laughs> intelligent and beautiful, unlike her surly and mean husband, <laughs> and if you want to test that out, I request that you don't talk to Brenda. <laughs> David, for much of his life, 
well, the much, much of, of his prime years was on the run, trying to escape being killed by the king of Israel, who had great power and resources. And many of David's songs are written during that time, and, and they say things like, Lord, defend me against my enemies. Protect me. David was constantly aware of the fact that he was in danger. There was a contract on his life. And yet so many of David's psalms, they were poems and songs, were songs of thanksgiving. And I've asked three people to to stand and read a scripture to us. First of all, Psalm 100. together, amen that? Amen. That means truly, truly. We believe that to be true. We affirm it and we, we stand with David and with Tim in that truth. And the next one is from Psalm 106, first couple of verses. And again, can we amen that? Amen. amen. And the last psalm that I want to read, I've asked Brenda to read. It's a long one, so, of course. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord my God, I have called to you for help and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O oh Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O oh Lord, I call. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me, O Lord. Be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth. You clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be solemn. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. <laughs> Can we say amen to that one together? Amen. amen. Absolutely. It's obvious that David did not escape times of suffering and despair. But he was aware at all times that God was watching over him and would deliver him. When we gather together and we read psalms like this, or... We do as Paul instructed the Ephesian church in 519 to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to sing and make music in our hearts to the Lord. We're cultivating that spirit of thanksgiving, that attitude of gratitude in our hearts, because it doesn't come naturally. It is so easy as for us to become very inward focused, self-centered, and when we do that, it robs us of hope and confidence. I want to ask you to together affirm God's goodness and express your thankfulness to him. 
there's a psalm, it's Psalm 136, that we are pretty sure was written in order to be a call and response. And I think by the end of this psalm, you will believe what you're saying. I will read the first part, and then you, you speak the response. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day the moon and stars to govern the night. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. To him who led his people through the desert, who struck down great kings and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and gave their land as an inheritance.